Thank you, Kyle. Thanks. Um, so up next we have Andrew. Yes. And he's the downstairs installation. Yeah, my piece is right in the room here. It's called uh, Cold Shutdown High. Uh, it's called Cold uh, Shutdown, but I added the, the words Fukushima, which I hadn't mentioned to Jax when we talked about it, but um, <coughs> it is really about, well, I'll explain what it's about in a minute, but I was looking at the 20-year catalog of Squeaky Wheel, the magazine, The Squealer, which I hadn't seen, and I don't know why I, ha I didn't see it, I hadn't seen it. And the thing that it brings back to me is how much trauma uh, Buffalo has gone through, or our country has gone through. And uh, a place like Squeaky Wheel, and I know there's lots of remarkable things, positive things, happy things that happen here, people make work. But when you go through that catalog, you see trauma, trauma, trauma. This event, uh, Art Park 18, um, the coalition, what is it? Reproductive Rights, Coalition for Reproductive Rights. Um, it just the Gulf Wars, the, you know, it just goes on and on. Every event seems to be about a trauma, and this piece also is about a trauma. Uh, and I think there's something, um, I think, inherently important about that. Uh, when I came to Buffalo, I didn't really have too much to do with Squeaky Wheel. I, I, I did come to some of the screenings, but some of these major traumas I, I just couldn't participate with. I couldn't. And actually, this piece is the first thing I've made that there I feel like I'm engaged in my own way um, in something that was happening in culture that really kind of got into me, got under my skin, or I felt I could make something in reaction to. But, but just, just that as a, a point of departure, I was just thinking it'd be interesting to... Um, lay out what's happening in there both technically and then the, like in terms of a theory. And I think that the best way might be is to play this sound. Um, and I, we didn't do a sound check or anything, so I don't know what it's really going to sound like. But this is a sound that was made in 1949 by Harold Boda, who is actually the, the uh, um, he invented the modular synthesizer. He, he skipped, had the plans drawn out. He didn't really make it. He didn't make the modular synthesizer. He let Robert Moog do that. He, he lectured about it. He talked about it. He made components for it. He never actually made the thing. Um, Harold was an instrument designer. Uh, Moog went and had his business and did his thing and bought other parts from Harold and then went his own way. And Harold lived out here. I think, was it Chituaga? He lived in Tonawanda, which was it? <laughs> He's around here. The Harold Boda Sound Company is from right around here. Stana Vizolka, uh, who just was at the Birchfield, did work um, with Harold. But anyway, this sound you'll hear is a sound from 1949. So it's four years after the war ended. It was made on an instrument that Harold built after the war. And before uh, Harold died, he had told his son, Per, um, I wasn't first hand on this, but this uh, he is. Told, he told Per, uh, you know, I don't really care what you do with this, my archives and stuff after I, I'm gone, but they cannot go back to Germany. Right? And he was uh, very happy to be out of Germany once he got out of there. But this sounds, so let, let's hear it. This is 1949, so it predates what uh, Stockhausen was saying was the first electronic music. I mean, there's a reason he said that, and I, I do agree with Stockhausen. Most people don't. But um, this sound, I think, is remarkable for 1949, so let's see if it plays. If it doesn't play, just...
Yeah, it's going to start, it's gonna start happening. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so how that, this sound connects to the piece in a couple ways. There's a similar sound that's happening here, and it is made with just a simple oscillator, a simple sound that's oscillating. And um, when you look at the piece and it's playing, you see these colors moving. And what those colors are, are is sound translated into video. But I'll come back to that in a minute. When Harold made that, you know, he made that for the, for the studio in Germany. And it was Stockhausen who said, ooh, that's way too noisy. What is that? We want precise notes. <laughs> and I think Harold said, really? Oh, you know. <laughs> and uh, he left. And so I think this sound here that we hear <laughs> was just basically said, that's just noise. I mean, that's, you know, what is, what is, that's not, what could you do with it? That's the sound of an, you're the engineer, you made that sound, but that's not something somebody else could make music with, right? And Harold was like, well, but I'm, I'm an instrument maker, yeah, so. So there's a trauma there. Uh, you know, the war in Germany, leaving Germany, uh, basically separating with the most, one of the most uh, important schools of music and musical thought in Germany, and there was another one in France. Had he been in France, you know, maybe Harold, we would all be using Boda synthesizers, and, Pear wouldn't have been an Alfred, and I never would have come to Buffalo. And, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, okay, so Jax mentioned um, Rudolf Steiner, because Rudolf, you guys know, Rudolf Steiner started the Waldorf School, which is a cigarette company, but he funded the Waldorf School of Education cigar company. Um, see if I can bring this back. Steiner uh, lived through World War I, and uh, was actually, you know, they got to him, the, um, in England, they got to him with arsenic. They killed him. He was poisoned uh, after World War I. Um, he, uh, Steiner was somebody who witnessed the suicide of so many of his friends and people around him that he, um, and even as a child, relatives passing, um, which is so much of it that he became kind of schizophrenic, and he knew it, and he heard voices, and, and he didn't know how to quite deal with it, so he made what he called a fantastic theory, a fantasy-based theory, about what, where these things are coming from. So Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, um, he also helped develop this thing we call special education, and the way he did that was he said, if you pay very close attention to someone with a disability, you can find out what it is that they need to develop in the way that they're going to develop. And that, that happened because he had a child who had like water on the brain condition. And he noticed that the child could move his hands. <coughs> so every day he had the child do more and more with his hands. And pretty soon the arms were moving. And then pretty soon the rest part of the body was moving. And then eventually the kid was running. And, uh, and oh, he refused to give the kid water. He figured, oh, water on the brain? We'll get the water out of the body, right? And so. Yeah. As the kid started to, whatever, I mean, I don't think we know what actually was happening scientifically, but Steiner said, if I pay attention, uh, we'll get this kid healthy. And the kid did. He got healthy. The condition went away. His brain, the pressure on his brain released. And, um, so the, the, the notion of trauma is something that I'm, I'm interested in, not as, as a, and, I, and I don't think Squeaky Wheel has been an organization that's interesting in finding trauma, but when something happens, that's the place you go and it opens up. And once it's open, you can see what's really in, you can see what's inside. It's uh, Lacan's famous dictum, which is, I love you very, very much. However, inexplicably, there's something inside you that I love more than I love you. Therefore, I'll have to destroy you to get the thing I really want or I really need which is like those kinder eggs. You know, the kids, don't, they love chocolate, but they'll just to get the toy. What's the toy? Then go back to the chocolate. So, so and, and that's how Harold was with the sound. Harold was that way with sound. Harold Bode was that with sound. Rudolf Steiner was that way with culture. Um, he knew that illness could bring a, a great amount of light to our understanding of the world. Um, Joseph Boyce is someone 
who followed Steiner. And boys always said, start with the wound, start with the wound, start with the wound. And I've trained myself through these two fellows, Joseph Boys and Rudolf Steiner. And as much as I try to throw them off my back, they just jump back on. <laughs> but um, the piece here, so technically how it's made is um, taking the dictum, you know, like start with trauma or take something apart. Um, I took televisions apart and add my own coils so that you can put sound in and it makes the image move. That's not like my invention or even anything new, but um, I find it fascinating to be able to do that. So when I start my practice, like with these shapes, it's always in an analog realm, meaning if I drop a rock <coughs> on the monitor and it breaks, the breaking is analogous to me dropping the rock on the monitor. Um, I need to have the connection. So, I, so you have to find out what's in there. Now this is the basics of uh, what is also endemic to squeaky wheel or something, is uh, structuralism. Is that uh, structuralism is an activity whereby you take something apart or wound it, and you look at the parts, and you think about them, and you say, well, how does this function? How does the news function? How does a camcorder function? What's editing? And once you have all the parts apart, you put them back together so that the functions of the parts become articulate. See, because we don't normally think about an electron beam moving really quick and voltage and magnetic fields causing it to change its path or whatever. We don't think of that. It's invisible. It, it, it is, is invisible. So structuralism is a practice that lets us do that. Take it apart, put it back together so that um, the function becomes visible. So for my work, and uh, this here, uh, what becomes visible is uh, the electron beam being moved by sound. So the image is not a camera image, but in fact the sound moving the electron beam, and then me putting other magnets around the magnetic field in the TV to make it different. So um, that's my practice. I call that electrodynamic drawing. It's, it, that's what I call It's my way to make a drawing. I think of it as drawing, because I've thought, well, it's paperless drawing. Or um, I sometimes think sound is, in fact, invisible sculpture. The way I make sound is the way I would make sculpture. It's just invisible sculpture. It's paperless drawing. It's um, that kind of practice. Uh, I lost where that was going to go. <coughs> oh, Steiner did talk about biodynamic farming. I don't know if anyone knows that, but that's part of the beginning of organic farming. But, you know, Steiner believed that there were gnomes. He believed there were gnomes. And they lived in the ground, right? And the job of the gnome is to tickle the roots, to keep them happy. And uh, you know, he believed it. He talked to them. Um, there are other things that lived in there. And biodynamic farming was really figuring out what is in there. What's, what's in there? And there's all kinds of stuff that is very fascinating. And, um, what he thought about the earth and, and, and things. But um, he said that what you should do is take a ram's horn and cut it off, fill it with ram's blood, and cap it off with beeswax. Go to the northeast corner of your field, dig a hole, and bury it a certain amount into the earth and rebury it. And if you do that, this will cause a certain energy to move through the soil. And I'm thinking, this is really wild. I mean, you can make a movie based on someone doing that. Um, but what I, what I realized was that Steiner just wanted people to pay close attention. That's, that's what it was. I was thinking, you've got to cut off a horn of one of your animals. That means I've got to pick which one of those I'm going to do that to. I've got to do it. I've got to deal with all this. I've got to get the blood. How do I get the blood? If you start doing that, you've got to find this point in your field. You've got to dig so deep. If you dig so deep in the earth, you start to see what's in the soil. Um, he just wanted people to pay closer attention. He saw after World War I a lack of attention to the things that give human beings uh, what they need to, to, to really feel like they are worthwhile beings on the planet. And if, because if you don't, you commit suicide, or you have big wars, or you know, whatever. So um, that's the link um, 
with like in a short way description of the link with the um, technology. And then the specifics of this piece, because um, once I have these fields of lines moving, um, there's a designer, David Jones, who made a new piece of equipment called the MVIP. It's the um, Mini Video Image Processor. And it's set up to do just this, take audio signals, turn them into um, a video signal. Once I have them, it's, it's a problem of trying to figure out what to do with them. So you can take something apart, or you can, I guess then with the digital technology, these spheres that I have, those are more, I wouldn't say that I'm taking anything apart there. It's hard for me to say. That's the newer part of it. I'm using After Effects as a program. And it's, it's letting me do things with time which is to slow this, uh, what, what, what you're seeing in here is, well, first of all, it's easy to wrap now around a shape. But the thing that's really happening in here, for me, that's interesting is, it takes the video, which is a stream of images, and it does this. It slices them, and then it does that, so that they're running simultaneously on top of each other. And then we used to call this pixel displacement, where the, the image in the back has values in the pixels. These pixels are in line with pixels that are in the front, exactly in line. The value, I can say, of this pixel will push this pixel to do something else, kind of a little bit. It happens real quick. Okay, so what it's doing here is it's, it's like warping time back and forth between these two lines of time. But it's really the same image because it's a fraction of a second difference. So you end up with this kind of jerky, kind of weird movement uh, between the pixels, displacing each other. So I'm learning about that. That's what's happening in that, in that piece, um, technically. Now what I made, uh, why it's called cold, uh, cold Shutdown Fukushima was, and I, I think it's probably true for everybody, but when the, the earthquake in Japan hit and then the tsunami, it was just horrible. I couldn't stop checking in with NHK television and there were different websites that were giving up to date, you know, minute by minute sometimes what was happening at the plants. <coughs> the thing that really caught me was I decided to do Google Earth about four days after the earthquake. And I was completely shocked that there were already aerial photographs that have been taken. And I don't know if you've seen them. Have you done it? I don't know if you've done it. They're, they're still the old photographs from about three or four, five days maybe after of the devastation. And I just never expected to be that high up and see that much devastation and that meant that loss of life and um, so I was glued to my computer while these are rendering I kept checking rendering check checking and I realized that I was making I was one by one making each power plant I was paying attention to the colors people said they saw I was putting those colors in these these spherical balls they were talking about the cores and the rods and the you know all the stuff about the radiation I didn't know about and so those are only a few, and it to me is a kind of portrait of that trauma. But, you know, I just, I don't know. I mean, have quite a few friends in Japan, and they were all okay. Um, Eddie's parents, who owns Zaz, um, Eri, Eddie's parents, she lived in uh, Mi, uh, what's the name of the town? Mi uh, something, begins with an M, where the 22, most of the 22,000 people were there. Her mother lived there in an old folks home, but up on the hill. So she was safe. But now she's in America, um, out in Alfred. And, uh, um, OK, so those pieces are the hot element, the boiling, the bubbling. It's still um, there. Then there are those blocks of wood. And what I said was, in the thing, uh, some student made those at Alfred. And I've really caught on to this. They make things they don't realize, they can't understand what it is they made, and they throw it out. And I'm right there. <laughs> You're all done with that, thank you. <laughs> okay, those are, um, and what I said is, in the thing, that, that's a different kind of cold shutdown. It's when you're thinking, this is a, a Boyce, it's the last thing I'll say, uh, Joseph Boyce talks about flux and form. He worked with fat and felt, and you probably know the story of the crash, and um, putting fat on his bed, uh, burns uh, where he had fire burns and putting felt where he had frostbite. The Tartars did that for him. 
and he says that he worked with fat and margarine because um, it, you could hold it and it would start to melt and you could shape it a certain way and let go and then it would still hold its shape. And then he would put the fat right there on a chair, right, where, where all of our <laughs> margarine is. Um, or, you know, like you would say, shit, you know, it's a, a fat stool, a, you know, a stool in German is shit. So he put a, a wedge of fat right where you hold it all. Um, that it goes back again to the trauma of, of see Joseph Boys was a pilot and was very successful um, a very thoughtful person and he was given the opportunity to leave the army he, he, he went into the army he volunteered he went through Hitler Youth um, couldn't see the trouble got in the army and his um, commander saw in him the possibility that he could be out of the army because he was smart and he could have gone to college in Poland and he went for two or three days. He said, nope, I'm going to get back in this plane. Um, essentially though, it turns out he, he says he was trying to commit suicide the whole time and couldn't do it. Uh, why am I telling you this? Uh, um, flux to form, uh, yes, cold, hot, warm and cold thought. Basically, that, that when a student throws their stuff out, it's just gone cold. It's turned to bone. Okay, the, um, the fat and the felt um, don't actually mean... Um, th th that's all it is. That's bone in there. It's somebody's thought process that hardened and just fell to the floor. Right? And um, the buildings in Fukushima just really exploded. I mean, they weren't able to hold the intensity of the thought of physics. I mean, maybe we shouldn't go there. Maybe we should. I don't know. But the, the hot, the physics, that thinking is so hot that when it explodes, we don't even have anything to contain the thought. We don't have a container for the thought process that makes a nuclear power plant. So that's that. Um, Joseph Boyce, and again, the last thing I'll say, I saw an interview with him where he's leaning against one of his sculptures and he said it's a pile of, I don't know if you've seen it, it's like felt this high, it's called battery or fond. It's about this high, I think that's what it's called. And then on top there are copper plates and then there's a big stack of copper plates and uh, it comes to a total of 2,000 pounds. And he wanted 2,000 pounds of felt but he couldn't get it, he couldn't do it, it just was not doable. So he, he made the uh, copper and the felt. <coughs> he's leaning on it, and the interviewer says, asks him a question, and Boy says, well, it's like these bodies back here. And the interviewer goes, bodies? He goes, yeah, yeah, these bodies behind me. Um, they're something about conducting heat and warmth and this and that and the other thing. And I thought, what is he talking about, bodies? Well, it turns out there's a very famous photograph of two tons of human hair that have been collected to make felt blankets for ostrich. And, and that was the 2,000 pounds that he had behind him. And, um, you know, for as much as he dealt with the trauma, he couldn't just draw images of people starving or death. He had to make what he called the counter image. It's the counter image. So this pile of felt and copper is the counter image to the, the pile of human hair, which, is, which are, are the bodies. But he referred to them as bodies. So in terms of a narrative or something about something, this is my kind of counter image. It could be beautiful, it could be fascinating, but really to me it's devastating. What this, this thing is about nothing I want to really be a part of. So that's my, my thing. So if you have questions, I can answer them. Or if you don't, I can drive back to Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was actually just curious, you said that, that there's a way that, that, or a program that, that can transmit audio signals into to video images or something yeah. for video signals that has yeah. to exactly work. Boy, that's a, that's a great workshop for Squeaky Wheel. There's lots of ways to do it, you know. There's, uh, there's lots of ways. There's lots and lots of ways. The way I do well, it. Well, which way were you re referring to? Uh, uh, well, I wasn't use. I don't use computer programs for that. You could. I do this thing where I take magnet wire and I wrap it around the back of the tube of the t TV and I run voltage into it, sound, which is voltage, and it makes a magnetic field and that causes the TV to behave differently. Um, the problem is, no, 
you do it. Because uh, you know what happens when you pass electricity through something it resists? What happens? <laughs> no, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And then you have a fire several times. <laughs> you keep remaking your thing. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> so if you do it, you know, be, be careful. Uh, you got to run them for like 15 minutes at a time. Um, I was really interested in the way you sort of started your presentation, rooting it in your experience in Buffalo. And one of the things that's really great about places like Squeaky Wheel is that they're also, I'm looking at you, Tammy, involved in helping preserve the history of the documents that document that type of trauma. And one, and the reason why I bring this up is because it's relating to a trauma right now that I think Buffalo and the rest of the country is experiencing with the suicide of this young boy who was being bullied by his peers, Jamie, um, because he was queer. And there's a document that you were involved with helping produce, which was mm -hmm. Chris Hill's interview with Sadie Benning. Mm -hmm. When she was in town, oh yeah, she I recently that. made yeah. digital yeah. through yeah. Squeaky Wheel's efforts. Yeah. So, getting back and like revealing this sort of part of your past and mm -hmm. and your experience in Buffalo, I'm curious to get back to the point at which you're talking about the sort of this inability to engage in the trauma mm -hmm. and what you're sort of positioning as uh, e exploration of traumatic issues through very structural, the signal, right. following systems, looking at, you know, these sort of aerial maps, for example, and that kind of, that way to, to position yourself as not just a spectator, but as someone that can process this type of trauma. I'm curious if you can also go back to that time when you were in Buffalo and what it was about your exploration maybe as an artist or what what were those um, things that prohibited you from engaging oh, well, in the way that <laughs> so many people were which was sort of direct address yeah. etc so maybe well, take us back to that I'm gonna be open with you coming to Buffalo is like pulling teeth for me okay uh, I've been dragged here by Jacks and Don Metz and <laughs> Uh, various things. Uh, it's very hard for me to come back. I, I'm not saying it's, I'm not like happy doing it. Uh, I kept telling Jax, come on, man, it's, come on, it's 7 o'clock. No, 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 talk today. No, come on, it's 8 o'clock. I don't want to go. Right? Um, I, I, geez, I didn't know um, about the trauma. I, I would say about the, the child who committed suicide. I don't know about this um, story because we're, we're considered part of Rochester where I live. We get, we don't, Buffalo's not the local news, it's like Rochester or whatever. But, um, it was national this was news. National it was news. national yeah. news. And it was international news. Yeah. Oh, and this yeah. was a young boy who was actually, he, he identified himself as bisexual and he was bullied. And it is one of the... How, how recent is that? Is it uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. 14 years old, hung himself. And this is another um, statistic of the um, gay community. Yeah, so it's pretty, it's pretty profound. I, you know, the thing <coughs> I do know that I, I, I have known, and part of coming to Buffalo and going to Hall Walls really, because uh, I worked at Hall Walls uh, with Chris and Barb and Ed and Don Metzner, uh, as you chart, if, if you, and I wish somebody would make this chart, as funding for the arts declines in high schools and in our culture, violence in schools and our culture goes up. It's a direct correlation. As arts fundings go down, violence goes up. And everyone looks at the rise in violence and they, they can assign certain things and if children are involved in TV and this and that and the other thing. But I just think if arts funding goes down, you're cutting away for us to value human life. It's easier, uh, um, I don't want to be so harsh to say, but it's, it's easier to kill a bird if you don't know its name, right? Um, when we say we hear the birds, we hear the birds. Well, in the 1800s, when people said they heard, they heard a bird, and it was the, this bird, that particular bird. Well, if you know each bird and how, what their song is, you can't kill it. It's harder to kill it. And now the kids don't even, you know, 
learn how to sing, let alone hear Bert. They don't know who Messiaen is. They don't know how Bert songs have been incorporated into music for years, you know. And uh, so whose job is it to provide arts education? Is it the parents? Is it the schools? I mean, I, I think if you, if you look at that, you would see that they're, they're proportional. I know Sadie say, found her way out through art. And hopefully so. somebody watched that cable <coughs> access TV uh, program and recognized themselves in Sadie, and you were able to bring that to them. Yeah. I guess that's sort of my point, is that you had mentioned this thing about not being able to engage in trauma, and I found it so amazing because you were the person documenting yeah. testimony of uh, a, an amazing artist, but also someone that was very young that was sharing their experiences in direct address, which is so often wrapped up in how we view the media of the early 1990s, late 80s, that type of period of how media was being used. and. Whether or not that, you know, your maybe inclinations towards looking at things through more structural form yeah. was at odds. And, and when you say that you hate coming to Buffalo, man, I like that bums me out. But no matter what, I hope it's not because there was something traumatic in your own artistic experience that somehow... Um, no, not in my artistic experience. No. <laughs> okay. I, I had a bad relationship. <laughs> Well, that would do it. And, and my brother used to lock me in uh, sleeping bags. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was really harsh, you know. Yeah. did that when my parents weren't home. And I wasn't allowed to tell them. Yeah. Right? Um, the thing about Sadie is, and I think this is very important, Sadie did it. Sadie made the work. Teaching, if you're a teacher, you can tell students things. <coughs> you can show them examples of things. But they're not going to believe they can do it until they see you do it. And this is the thing about technology that drives me nuts, is when teachers say, you know, oh, the students are going to show you more about the thing than you, you know. That's bullshit, right? The way you learn is you see somebody explain something, and then you see them do it. And when you see them do it, you bear witness to that, that lets you know you can do it. That's education, or that's what it used to be. You know, so if somebody says, this is how you center a pot, because I'm from Africa, I gotta say. <laughs> you center the pot, and you see how the person does it, and then you sit down to do it. You can't do it, but you saw someone do it. It's because you saw them do it, you know you, it, it can be done. It's not a written thing. It's not uh, some myth about, you know, clicking here or there. Sadie did it, right? I just interviewed, you know, I just helped with an interview. Sadie did that, so, you know, that's the important thing. Staina broke open the television. No, Namjoon did it, and um, the 8mm News Collective hunted down the news crews, you know. I learned a lot from that. I didn't do it, but I learned a lot listening to Barbara, and, you know, she didn't know I was listening to her in the editing suite. <laughs> Everything she said, you know. Tony Conrad. Well, I won't even go there. I mean, <laughs> that guy is, uh, you know what he is? He's a creep. And, and, and he would appreciate the comment. See, Tony? I know it, you know it. And we know what I'm talking about, you creep. And, and I know that your socks don't match for a reason. And the green pants. I know what those are about. So. But Tony's not here, is he? He hasn't <laughs> been here for a while. Yeah, so. he checked out. He's Thank Christmas. you. <laughs> okay, so I got new brakes. I got front brakes last week. I got new back brakes this week. So I'm safe to drive. Now. Yeah, I got my bag right here. <laughs> no, uh, any more questions? I don't want to keep you guys here for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do um, actually just want to make a really quick closing remark. Um, in relation to Andrew's uh, installation, actually we have a fundraiser for um, disaster relief funds in Japan coming up. Um, it's going to be two different programs back to back of um, 
um, videos made from Japan from the 1960s forward. There's going to be two different programs. It's kind of a pay what you can, $5, $10. Um, come on down. It's on October 19th, which is a Wednesday. Um, but there's going to be a lot of really wonderful films also shown during that. And I want to thank you guys again, Kyle and Andrew, and everybody for being here. Those were really wonderful artist talks. Thank you. Thank you.